Welcome to the Masters of the Grind Grindcast. I'm your host, Jason Rutherford, and on today's episode, we speak with filmmaker extraordinaire, Rolf Konefsky. What? It's okay. There's nothing out there. Ah! made you want to get into film was it exposure to your dad's work or was there a particular were there any particular films that you saw that inspired you to choose filmmaking as a career sure well I, I got into film at a pretty young age um my father was a film editor he uh did mostly documentaries though um so I really wasn't into that world but when I was around three years old he introduced me to Abbott and Costello movies uh because uh growing up in New York around the time every Sunday at 1130, there would be uh, an Abbey Stella film and he was a fan when he was a kid. So the first one I remember seeing was the very end of Abbey Stella meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I, it was funny and scary and I loved it. So that influence and went on to Abbey Stella meet Frankenstein. And of course those movies really influenced a lot of my first film and uh, where much of my career has, has gone since. Was that always on your mind from, from that point on to like, I want to be a, a director? Was that an attainable where you're like, this is what I'm going to do? No, I direct. I didn't start with directing. I, I, I was always telling stories. So I, I sort of created my own Abigail style stories and then came up with my own characters, but I wanted to act originally. I, I, uh, I liked comedy and I like making people laugh. So I think, I, I guess a clown, I first wanted to be a clown. Then I moved into comedian and then, uh, I uh, did some theater in high school and before that. And I started moving into directing when I did some high school plays that were so bad that I was like, if I'm going to work this hard as an actor and the result is lousy, I want to have more control over it. So that's when I decided to move behind the camera, you know, behind the stage and uh, start doing uh, writing and directing more than focus on the uh, in front of. But it was great training ground because uh, being taking acting classes and acting experience makes you a much better director and a writer for that matter too. So you can write dialogue that people can actually say. And, uh, and I like actors, so I, I get along with them well. And I think that's definitely helped my, uh, my career. And then you went to college before you made your feature, correct? Was that a film school? I went to college. I, well, I, I got, okay. So I got my video camera when I was like 13 years old. And I started playing around with it. And, and my father said, you know, I, I didn't really bug him about it because he just thought I'd be interested, but then I'd move away and do something else. And then I finally showed him like a little short film I cut inside the camera, my first sort of narrative called Breaking and Entering that I did with a friend. And when he saw that, he said, oh, so he's, he's becoming a filmmaker. Um, so when I was in high school, I did two feature length films that was very interesting. I started doing... PA work over the summer. My father got me on a few independent films. Uh, I worked for Trauma and Trauma's War and uh, a little slasher movie called Pose for Murder, which is out there but hard to find. And all of that was sort of leading to, uh, to my first feature. And then when I went to college, uh, you know, the thing was I wanted to go to a film school uh, that had a college. My, my parents wanted the college that had a film department. So we finally settled on Hampshire. So I went to Hampshire which um, had a film program, but they were also very much into documentaries because Ken Burns was their big graduate there who had become the big name. So they hated Hollywood and hated commercialism. They liked Hitchcock, but they hated horror. So I fought with them doing like these short films, Super 8 movies for a while. And then while I was still in college, I was really pushing to, to get to do a real feature length film. And my parents saw the shorts I had done and they thought I was ready and with a lot of support and uh, help funding, they, uh, they were able to put together my first movie. So I was in college when I took a semester off to make There's Nothing Out There, my first movie, and then went back to try to prove that I learned something from making the movie uh, before I, I, uh, I moved on. <laughs> um, did you choose you know, making a scary movie because of financial reasons or because or they're easier to sell? At the time, I was, yeah, I was, I was trying to find something that was commercial and viable, and this was... I, I, okay, so when I was 14, that's sort of when I started renting all the horror films out because I started 
thinking, if I'm going to direct, what do filmmakers start with? And at the time, it was horror, low-budget horror films, because I looked, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg's early stuff was, you know, television movies, something evil, dual. Oliver Stone did The Hand and Seizure. Francis Ford Coppola, Dementia 13. I mean, I did my research, so I said, okay, if you're going to start with a horror film, I want to know the genre. So I started renting out every horror film on video. And a lot of them were really bad, but, you know, a few like Carpenter's Halloween, you know, of course, and Sam Remy's Evil Dead and Peter Jackson, you know, Bad Taste and Dead Alive, you know, they, I mean, there's, you can do something with it. So those were the ones that sort of inspired me and my love for comedy horror, um, uh, going from Abby Stello and then being, you know, solidified with uh, John Landis's American Wealth in London and Tom Holland's Fright Night and Tremors, uh, although that came up after <laughs> I made mean, There's Nothing Out There. Um, we really uh, said, okay, I want to do something that's commercially viable. So the horror genre at the time in the mid eight in the mid eighties, late late eighties, with video and home video, they were making a fortune. So I said this was the safe bet. So I convinced my parents that we could do a horror film, so you could sell it as a horror movie, and the comedy would be spread by word of mouth. And like they did with Fright Night, you know, they sold it kind of straight, but then people loved the humor. So I thought you got to deliver <clears throat> in the genre, so you got to give people the at the time some sex and nudity and violence and gore, but at the same time, it was really a commentary about, in my mind, sort of the lazy conventions of horror films and people like the cat scare that jumps out of nowhere and people dropping the knife and going to the basement. And so when I wrote the script, I was in high school at the time. I was almost 18, just about to turn 18. And I did as an exercise to see how long it would take me to write a low budget exploitation horror film because I remember the uh, infamous uh, Siskel Niebert at the movies episode where they were trashing the whole slasher genre and just hating them all. And I started writing this movie and about five pages in, I had to decide if it was going to be a slasher movie or a uh, monster movie. And I went with a creature feature because I thought you could do more with it creatively. And so that's why I went in that direction. But I was able to still uh, send up all the tropes. Um, the thing is, Studying the horror genre and then going to the Fang I was reading religiously Fangoria and all the horror magazines and going to the conventions. I really found the uh, the love for the genre and the fans that I was like, you know, they're not stupid. You know, they really want to like the movie, but they want to like a good movie. So instead of wanting to make fun of the genre of the horror film, I just wanted to make fun of the lazy conventions of the genre. So, you know, I said, look. You come up with something better than a cat that jumps out of nowhere. They've done it to death. You've done it a thousand times, you know, from Alien with Sigourney Weaver to, you know, you can come up with something new. So I said, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to like do it, then make fun of it. And hopefully people will then like move on and come up with something more creative and do something else. So that was my whole thing was not to 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 make fun of the genre, but to to try to like just bury the cliches to lift up the genre. And I thought I think that comes across because I wasn't spoon feeding like necessarily like a trauma horror comedy where it's all close-ups and googly eyes and just over the top. I was doing something that was uh, a horror comedy, but with, I thought, some intelligence to it. And if you knew the genre, you got all the jokes. The problem was there was a lot of people who read the script. I remember I took a, a class at, at Hampshire at the time in the summer, in the spring, and the teacher who had written some stuff just thought it was a completely Friday 13th ripoff. He just, he didn't see the jokes at all. He thought it was just another one of the standard run-of-the-mill horror slasher movies. So I knew he didn't get it. I'm like, no, you're, you're not seeing the other level of it. I said, it, it works on that level if you don't know the cliches, but if you do, you're going to get it and you're going to have hopefully a good time with it. And, and you know, I was lucky enough when we finished the movie and showed the film to audiences uh, from Ohio horror marathons, they burst into applause in places. The, 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 there's a crossing the fourth line, fourth wall at one point, the cat scare, things that they just loved and, and completely got what I was going for. So I was I was very pleased. Now, selling the movie was a whole other animal. But <laughs> was was it um, successful? Well, there's the there's the 50 million dollar question. So it, 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 over time, it's been a cult movie and it's built up an audience at the time. Well, we'll go into the history of the genre. So what happened was we shot the film in, in 1980. I wrote the script in 87. We shot the film in 1989. So it was right on the end of the 80s. The horror market was still big. We had like five or six horror magazines. And then once we hit 1990, the horror market kind of collapsed. There was a big problem. Uh, everything started well. It's like I remember because Tremors came out and didn't do well. Nightbreed was sold as a slasher film, which it wasn't. 
um, and they didn't know what to do with the genre and the film. And so horror became kind of this albatross and it always comes back in, in waves, but um, no one knew what to do with it. So we were showing the film and the studios didn't quite get it because they were, which I heard was later exactly what they said about the screenplay to American Wolf London, that it's too funny to be scary. It's too scary to be funny. We don't know what it is. You can't, you know, if it's a horror film, why are people laughing? I don't get it. So at the time, no one had really, I mean, done this type of crossing the line. And there was nobody in the movie. Uh, you know, the lead film was a friend from my high school who was great, Craig Peck. But it was all first time actors. We had no names. We had no you know, we had a low budget, but, uh, you know, it, it didn't really go. So it took years struggling around trying because we didn't want to abandon the film. At that point, there was a few con like Hemdale was around. And I remember they were interested, but they were like straight to video. If you want a theatrical, you won't get any money. We didn't want to throw the film away. Troma wanted the film back then. But we knew if it was released by Troma, it would become a Troma film. And people would think that it was made by Lloyd Coffin because anything they acquired at the time was just their movie. So I didn't want to do that for my first film. So, you know, we had a couple good screenings. We got some film festivals, Florence Film Festival, got really good reviews. Audiences seemed to love it, but trying to sell it was a nightmare. So it took about three years. And then <laughs> finally, we sort of, we opened up the film in New York. We sort of four-walled the theater, which is not easy to do and really expensive in New York. Um, parents really got behind it and we opened it up in uh, 1992, January of 92, um, at the A Street Playhouse, which was a revival house. So they didn't really do new movies, but they were going to take a chance in our film for a week. And if the numbers were good, it was a place called City Cinemas. We were, they were going to move us to Greenwich Village and we would have had a bigger play. But as fate would have it, it was a uh, Super Bowl weekend and there was a blizzard in New York. So the film got some play, but it didn't do enough numbers. So they moved it to Midnight's and it played Midnight's for a couple of weeks or months. Um, over the years, there were some people who went to see it in New York. And I found out um, Eli Roth was going to, to NYU at the time and he saw the movie and really enjoyed it. And a few other people, you know, over the years have come up to me and caught the film. But um, it was enough that we got the Lemley Theaters in, in California. Uh, Greg Lemley heard about the movie. They wanted to start some Midnight movies at the uh, uh, Monica, Santa Monica fourplex that used to be down there in Santa Monica. So in April, we moved the film down there as a midnight movie on Fridays and Saturdays. And we got a great review in the LA Times. We got, I mean, the, the, the press really loved the film because it was a comedy horror and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a gore piece and they understood it. So they, they, they really appreciated the film, you know, despite the low budgetness and everything. And it started building up an audience. We had like 20 people the first night, then like 30 people the second. And the second weekend was like 45, then was about 60 people. So it was going in the right direction. And then <laughs> the LA riots. And if anyone remembers that, uh, there was a curfew on the entire, you know, <laughs> California, the state of you know, Los Angeles. So no midnight showings. All the theaters had to close. That was the end of the theatrical run. Um, bad luck, but at least we had enough intention that we were able to make a sale to HBO and Prism at the time, Prism Entertainment put it out on, on uh, video and uh, laser disc through image. So the film like had its little life. I mean, it took us three and a half years to get it, but um, I moved on. I moved to California and then just started continuing my career hoping, but since we did it in New York and it wasn't a big breakout, it didn't really count. So I had to reinvent myself and start again in California. It took me more years to try to get in the door and, and start the career. But over the years, the film refused to die. And, um, and we could probably talk about this a little bit, but about five years later, and I had said at the time, because I saw the audience's reaction around the world, I said, look, if someone comes along and makes a film like this with a, with a big enough name and some money behind it, it can make a fortune. And, Sure enough, uh, Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson proved me right with Scream, which is a much bigger film, much scarier film. Not a, not. A, I mean, it, it makes fun, but it's not a parody. Um, and I really enjoyed Scream when I saw it. I thought it was great. I, I saw some similarities, but I really enjoyed the film. And because of that film, people started to rediscover there's nothing out there. And I started finding out online that said, wait a minute, did this film – borrow anything from that film and so we became like a footnote in the history of that and over the last 30 almost 35 years now 
um, the film has been growing in uh, interest and popularity. And uh, um, it's it's the little movie that could and refuses to die, which is great. So um, it's going to come out again on Blu-ray uh, in October with another big special edition. And uh, it's, it's amazing uh, what this little movie has done um, over the years. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, uh, are, are there any tricks of the trade that you can divulge to wannabe filmmakers and independent filmmakers that are struggling to get their films off the ground? Well, obviously, times have changed drastically since, since I made my film. The 80s are not where we are now in the world. Um, there's no real tricks. I mean, the, 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 I guess the only rule in this town is nobody knows anything. So everyone's very easy to, to say you can't do it, it can't be done. And I say if every filmmaker, if you thought hard enough about how much work and time it would take you to make a movie, you wouldn't do it. So there's got to be kind of a little bit of a blind optimism that you need to go into and just, you know, will it to happen and hopefully find enough support and people crazy enough to join you on your adventure to do this thing. Um, the only thing I say is that obviously with the technology today, with cell phones, I mean, any, anyone can make a movie for, for nothing. And, and I mean, I did that when I was 14 with a video camera, we weren't, you know, um, with, with this new release uh, of there's nothing out there. There's actually going to be, um, they want to put out all my home movies that I did from the age of 14 to like now. Uh, so my two feature length films and my shorts are all going to be included as bonus features on this thing. So you can really see how I sort of self-taught my, uh, myself to be a, become a filmmaker over the, over the course. And I think that's a good lesson for people. So you just, you need to go out and do it. I mean, rather than, you, you know, you can learn things from books and taking classes, working on movie sets are great in any form from PA, production assistant, to whatever department, but you learn more from doing than from just watching, you know, but it's good to watch and read. But when you do do something, and this is the big thing for writers and filmmakers is you got to finish it. You're going to hate it at some point. It's, it's never going to be exactly what you wanted. There's always, I need, you know, the biggest studios with $300 million films are never satisfied with what's going on there. They're always rushing. But if you get it done, you'll learn so much from doing it. And you have to show that you're responsible as a filmmaker because if someone's going to give you a dollar or, you know, a million dollars, they need to know that you're going to get this thing completed, that, you know, you, you don't start a project and then, you know, two years later, I, I need more money. We're still working on it. So you, you got to get it through the finish line uh, and, you know, to make that happen. What was it like collaborating with your dad uh, on There's Nothing Out There? Well, my dad, well, my dad and I are great. We have a very uh, cool relationship. Uh, we always got along wonderfully. He was always very supportive. Um, he never pushed me to get into the film business. I mean, he probably wanted to deter me than anything else. But my mother, um, when I was really young, she was into theater. She was a she was a singer and a dancer. She did some Broadway stuff, so she was a performing uh, artist. And my my father was, uh, you know post-production and editing, but they were very creative. So they encouraged me, which is crucial to anyone trying to get into the arts. It's very, very hard if you don't have support from friends and family. So my father was very impressed with what I was doing and, and that I was sort of self-taught on everything. Um, I remember going into the editing room because he had a uh, post-production facility for many years. And I used to watch, he had a uh, 60 millimeter print of Dumbo. And whenever I was there, they throw Dumbo up on the steam back, the old editing the machine before computers and the Avid and everything. And I used to watch that backwards and forwards and stuff. So I think, you know, that's a great learning thing too. And it's an amazing cartoon, you know, the animated Dumbo, please. Um, so uh, uh, that was one thing. And then he had, so his inspiration was he had, he had done, he'd worked with um, a very famous New York filmmaker named Melvin Van Peebles. And Melvin, like a year and a half before, did a movie with his, with his son, uh, Mario, big actor, and they did a movie called uh, Identity Crisis, this uh, crazy comedy where uh, Melvin play, uh, Mario plays a bunch of parts. And my father, watching their relationship as father and son and filmmaker and actor and stuff, was really encouraged. And, you know, so when I was really pushing to do my first film, he thought it'd be a great idea to do it with me and, and do something like that. So we were able to raise a little bit of money and he made a promise to himself that he ever got any money to make a film, he would make make it happen just make it happen we knew we had the post-production connections which was very good at the time because we were this was still shooting on film we were shot we shot super 16 and eventually blew it up to 35 millimeter but we knew we could get the film finished if we could just get it shot and we were able to raise some money from private investors and then my parents went so far as to mortgage the house 
to help finance the movie um, because we did it for in actuality cash probably about a hundred and twenty or thirty thousand dollars it was very low budget but it was a 24 day shoot it was you know it was great for me because it was the first time there was a real crew there were actors that wanted to be there um, because I had done everything else with like just you know, friends and people just thinking it was going to be a fun time and, you know, making a movie is can be fun, but most of the time it's really a lot of work and not what you'd expect it to be. So um, we, we just jumped in on it and, and uh, shot the movie over the crazy summer in 89. Um, and then it took about a year to finish it because he was calling on favors and deferred payments. I mean, we got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things for cheap to, uh, to no money. Um, and, uh, and then we were very proud with the film. So we didn't, want to just throw it away. And, and that's another big thing when you're like, you know, n no one cares more about your film than the filmmaker. So you, you, you know, you can always hope when you make a deal or sell your movie that whoever's going to buy your distributor is going to uh, really give it the love and attention that it deserves that you feel, but they're never going to, because for them, it's just product. So that's where you lose control of your films. And, and almost every film I've done that I haven't sort of owned or controlled has happened that way. So you're always fighting the, the rules and the laws of uh, distribution. Um, but there's nothing out there. We stayed with it. We had screenings. We had festivals. We played like crazy on it before we got the release. So it was a, a great experience. And, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, we never made a lot of money off of it. The movie was never really a financial success. Over the years, It's it's been released now. I think this will be the sixth release of the movie, which is pretty amazing for a movie 30-something years. So it just keeps coming back. And it seems like every time it comes back, it um, gets more fan base and more interest, and it and it doesn't date badly. Um, you know, it, it was funny as uh, about two years ago during COVID, um, there was a, a screening um, I found out at the Alamo Draft House in uh, um, Houston, Texas, and I contacted the guy who was doing it. They were going to do a double feature for the first time of Scream, and there's nothing out there. And I thought that was great. And they actually flew me and and my lead actor Craig Peck down there to do a little Q and a, and, and, uh, there was about 50 people, 50, 60 people. Most of them were young and hadn't even been born when the film came out. So I had no idea how it was going to play. And it played just like it did when it first opened. They were laughing at all the jokes. They got it all. And surprisingly enough, the humor actually held up better than screamed it afterwards, which is much slicker, much bigger movie, but because the jokes in scream were of the time, you know, there's making, there was like the, Richard Gere gerbil joke and all these things that, you know, you had to remember what those were, where I was never calling out films by names. It was just those things that pop out of your stomach when you least expect it, you know, alien creature, but I never said anything. So, and luckily all the films that I referenced, Hollywood's gone on to make 9,000 sequels and remakes. So it's still in the, in the, uh, in the, in the zeitgeist, you know? Um, so it was very fun seeing that. So sometimes, yeah, if you want your film to live forever, you, you, you try not to date it or, you know, put specific newspapers in it. You know, we didn't have any cell phones in the movie. I mean, obviously the clothes and the music, but in the same time, you know, you sort of forget about that when you're watching the movie and it's got an 80s vibe and and it's, it, and it is very big right now. So it's still popular. It's still being talked about. What, what did you learn on that film that they couldn't possibly teach you at film school? <laughs> well, OK, the, the, the big thing I learned, and I guess this will be a spoiler, is that uh, there was a, there was a scene in the movie in the script, there was a character being chased by this alien creature and is trying to escape from the monster. And he was supposed to grab a chandelier in the house and swing to safety from the chandelier. Well, the house we were shooting at didn't have a chandelier. So I kept thinking, how am I going to rewrite this and make this work? What can I do? And it had nothing to do with the movie, but I went to the movies and saw a film that was projected wrong. It wasn't the film's fault. They were just projecting it wrong without the mats. And you could see off the set of the microphones all over the movie and people were hysterical. And I realized in movies so much because everyone knows behind the scenes and box office and especially horror films and low budget films, there tends to be kind of this mistakes every now and then you see reflections you're not supposed to see, you, you know, and people are very aware of, of like, oh, oh, that's a mistake. So I thought it'd be funny to actually have the character grab the microphone and uh, save himself <laughs> that way. And the cat, the crew was looking at me like I was insane. It's like this is a horror movie. This that's a Mel Brooks gag. You can't, well, you can't cross the line and, and do that. And I'm like, yeah, you can if you just don't, uh, you know, stop the movie for it. But I think it'd, it'd be funny. So my father, who was the producer, of course, 
he asked me, you know, Ralph, will it be funny? And I said, yeah, I think it'll work. He goes, okay, do it. Luckily, because again, this is something, no way would a studio let me have done this thing. They'd be like, you can't break the line. You can't tell people it's a movie. It's going too far. But I, I wanted to do it. And hell, you can do anything. I mean, there's a, there's an homage to the Pink Panther and Spectre Clouseau, you know, fight scenes in the middle of the movie, which is like, what's that doing in a horror film? But again, I was doing what I love. So I was like, you know, I mean, and of course, we've seen that with Sam Remy with the Three Stooges and things like that. So when you're independent, you know, you don't have a lot of people, not a lot of money. So I did it. That became the most famous thing in the movie in a lot of ways. We got an article in Variety because of it. I mean, people were talking about this, this uh, breaking the fourth wall. So that taught me that if there's something in your movie that scares people, that people are like, you can't do that or that's going too far, that's what you hold on to. Don't get rid of it. You know, that's what people are going to remember. So, you know, don't, you know, it's like I mean, the old thing is like, don't cut funny. You know, if you're doing a comedy, don't cut funny. If it's funny, keep funny. Um, so I, I learned that. And uh, in, a, in a lot of my films later, that happened on and off too, where I would do something that, you know, there's a movie called The Hazing uh, that I did that will also be hopefully coming out soon in a big special edition. And there's a scene, it's a very much Night of the Demons, Hell Knight, the Evil Dead thing. And there's a scene where a guy's tongue while he's making out with his girlfriend gets very long. And it's this outrageous, sexy, gory, funny sequence. Um, uh, and people got really scared when they read in the script. They thought it was almost pornographic. And it was like, mm -hmm. he's like, no, I know I'm going to shoot this thing. But, but that was what, again, people are like, you're never going to get away with this. The producer had said, we're never going to get an R. And I said, yeah, I think we can because I know how to balance that line. And, you know, it's going to be implied. You're not going to see anything graphic, but you'll get it. And sure enough, uh, we got the R rating without a cut. And everyone talked about that scene, too. And that's the scene. Everyone's like, oh, my God, there should be more like that in the movie. So I keep going back to that saying, you know, trust yourself, trust your instincts, um, you know, and uh, you're, you, you can make something more original. Because if you're just copying what you've seen other people do, you know, you, you, you're you not going to stand out, you know, so you, you want to do something that, that makes a name for itself, you know, and, and stay honest to your vision, um, even though everyone will have an opinion, and everyone will advise you on their own opinion, you know, and, and sometimes it's not, you got to listen to them in places, because if everyone is like, this is just terrible, you know, don't don't get too stubborn and, and blow it, but, you know, you trust yourself, trust your instincts. What do you think of the state of Hollywood, and do you think, is, is streaming ruining everything? <laughs> well, well, it, okay. Streaming has done a few things. It it gives you a lot more platforms to get your movie seen. So you know, Tubi or all these sites, there there's thousands and thousands of movies. The problem is there's thousands and thousands of movies. So how do you get your film seen within all the other movies? So you could be there, but if nobody knows you're on that platform or you're streaming, you know who's going to watch it? You have to be. You have to know how to get your film. You know advertisements and, and uh, promoted. And that's really hard nowadays. Um, you know, there used to be a much more, you know, well, there was magazines and there were websites and they still are there, but there was a real catch 22. And I had that, then this went back to, there's nothing out there because, you know, when I was trying to get coverage on, on the film, we, we, you know, I was invited Fangoria and, you know, they never came. And, and then finally it was like, you know, get an article and they're like, well, we can't give you a pre article on it until your film has a distribution date. And it's like, well, we can't get a distribution date unless we get press on the movie so people want to see it. So as I said, it was a catch-22. And and uh, I, I wrote such a strong letter that I did get covered in uh, Gore Zone, their sister publication that was short-lived. But then me and uh, a movie called They Bite and one other film were covered as three independent films. So at least we got some play. But it was a lot of uh, promoting yourself. Um, I mean, you can use you know, LinkedIn and Facebook and, you know, Instagram, you know, everything you can to try to spread the word of your film. Uh, so there is a, a grassroot thing that, you know, goes back to the Grindhouse movies that you can still do nowadays. But it is like, how do you get the eyeballs on your film? How do you get people talking about it? You know, what can you do to to promote your film and, and get people seen? And it's it's really hard. I mean, because I I have a label. Uh, there's a record label that's starting up called Clatu Records. They just did the uh, Prom Night 2 soundtrack and they're releasing My Nightmare Man. And there's nothing out there. It's coming out and uh, the hazing. And they're doing a great job, but they're, they're, their first stuff didn't sell very well because, again, people don't know they exist. So it's like, how can we get the word? And they're even saying, how do we reach out to magazines and they, you know, they'll cover us? And people say, oh, I didn't know that was released. Because if I knew that was out, I'd, I'd pick it up. But you have to let people know. So that's the, that's the trick, you know, that it's nice that you have out, outlets and platforms. 
but you know, you're not, you're not going to get rich showing on Tubi. That's for sure. You know, you, you make anything at all. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think I just said, uh, there's nothing out there when we finally made the deal. Well, it wasn't us when we made a deal with trauma for the second release. And then trauma made a deal with vinegar syndrome for the Blu-ray release of which case vinegar paid $5,000 to trauma. And we saw $500 from that sale, which was the first money I actually ever saw from there's nothing out there. And it took 30 years. So, <laughs> you know, you're not as successful as they think you are, but uh, you know, again, you, the better or worse, you know, an artist or independent filmmaker do it for the love of doing it uh, more than the financial, like uh, we're going to get rich and famous from it. Well, speaking of rich and famous, this leads into my next question. Was there any ever talk about doing it? There's nothing out there. Sequel. There's been tons of talk. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's all comes down to money. It's like, if, if anybody wanted to spend the money and do it, I, I wrote a script, um, uh, years actually when we were in post-production of There's Nothing Out There, I came up with a really funny continuation to it that I really enjoyed and everyone who, a few people read the script liked it. But um, there was, there's never been enough interest, it seemed like, to to generate the financial. And again, yes, people are making movies for 10, 15, $20,000, but I don't know how to do a good version of, uh, of a sequel and, and to do it just for, just to do it, you know, and so people say, Oh, that movie sucked. You know, that was cheap as hell. I thought the first one was cheap. You know, this, yeah, you know, it's like, I don't want to, uh, you know, ruin the reputation of the first film by doing a, an inferior sequel. So I, I would, I would be happy to do one. And uh, Craig Peck said he would be happy to come back to do it, but it's been hard. So, I mean, right now, this is the, this, it seems to be the year of nothing, you know, um, <laughs> in many ways, more than one, but with the film showing again, and the release of the Blu-ray, the soundtrack coming out, there's going to be a record from uh, Terror Vision Records is doing a, a LP of the movie. Um, a friend of mine, special effects guy, did a beautiful uh, uh, model of the creature um, that we're trying to, uh, you know, figure out how to um, promote it and get more people, you know, make it. But it's expensive to make. But, I mean, here, I'll show you. This, he did this great... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's this is a perfect rendition of the creature That's from awesome. uh, from There's Nothing Out There. It's you know, sort of a two of a kind. There's only been two of these things made, um, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's really fun. Um, and uh, and then uh, Bear Managing uh, Bear Manor Publishing is going to be releasing uh, my <laughs> forever being worked on book that I started in college called Making Nothing at the Age of Twenty because. As I said, when I went to Hampshire, they didn't want to give me any credit for making a movie, even though I was majoring in film. So I said, well, why don't I write down what I learned and maybe you can give me some credit. So I started writing this book and I wrote a good chunk of it. And then when we went to, when I realized that there's an internet and we were going to, I said, let's publish, put the book on the internet. I updated it like 10 years later in 2000 to everything that happened because we had just finished the movie. So we were about to sell it. So I said, well, I'll tell you the rest of the roller coaster. And now, after all this time, another 23 years, you know, have passed. So I updated the book again. So now we have a, you know, like full book. Uh, and uh, and I thought it would be fun to release the unproduced screenplay uh, with it. So I think it's going to be The Making of Nothing followed by the, There's Still Nothing Out There. That was the name of the sequel. If you were afraid of nothing, it's back. Um, and uh, I don't think we'll ever make this version of the script, but uh, at least people can read it. So between... You know, all of the stuff, you know, and there's new T-shirts even. Uh, there's a thing called Clown Shirt that did T-shirts and, and hoodies and uh, uh, coffee mugs, um, which are really cool. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> so you never say never, you know. Getting back to your dad for a second, he was the editor on one of the most infamous Grindhouse movies of all time, Joel M. Reed's Blood Sucking Freaks. You were like four or five at the time, I guess. Do you remember anything from that period or do you well, uh, have I mean, any fun I, Joel I, stories? I was, yeah. Well, I mean, what, what year exactly was Blood Sucking Freaks when it came out? Was it 74? Was it was 74? It? Was that the, okay. I think so. I don't remember 74. Anyway, I, I, okay. The only thing I remember was he was cutting the film. I was very young and he never didn't let me in the editing room. You know, I, I would not watch for a long time, but I remember when he was cutting Blood Sucking Freaks, they like didn't want me in the room. They were cutting something that was horrible. <laughs> Or, you know, very graphic and and they didn't think there was something I should be seeing at the age of five, which they're absolutely right. Um, the funny thing is, I, I didn't really know about that movie. I mean, I heard of it, but I didn't know it until high school and I rented it out one night. And I was shocked to first off, see my father's name 
in the credits. And I was like, my father cut this movie. And then in the first scene during the show in the audience at the, at the fan base, he's in it. And I think I spotted him. I'm like, wait a minute, that's, that's my dad. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the film became in college kind of like an endurance test. I would, I would show it to people and to see if they could get through it. And we'd make bets to see when they would not, if they can make through the, the famous brain sucking straw scene, you know, they would make it through the movie. But, uh, you know, some people, thought, I had one friend who loved the movie and thought it was hysterical. He thought I maybe was named after uh, Ralphus, which I was not. Uh, but um although that would explain a lot you know uh so i so that's why i remember you know i i remember joel and reed though um when we had our first screening of the finished version of there's nothing out there my father was still in contact with joel and he came to see it in new york and uh he said he really enjoyed the film and he said that he's uh, uh passing the mantle to me you know <laughs> which was which is very nice um so, so that was really cool. And then I got to hang out with Joel one day in, in California. He came out for a special screening of Blood Sucking Freaks. And we spent the night with a few other people at a bar, uh, Bordner's down in Hollywood. And that was a night I won't forget listening to Joel and Reed's stories. And <laughs> it's quite, quite a character there. But yeah, my father cut uh, three of his films, I think. And uh, uh, no, four, was it four? Three or four? Four, four, cut four of the films. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I remember about uh, yeah, blood sucking freaks with my dad. I mean, he, you know, he's talked about it in the past, and I think he he talks about it in your documentary. Um, so uh, you know, and there's been some books written about it. There was a book that just came out that was something like 20 years in the writing, and uh, I I picked it up, and uh, my father thought like you know, why wasn't he interviewed for this book? And I was reading, I'm saying you were interviewed for this book. It was just such a long time ago, you don't remember. So <laughs> there's quotes from him all over the place in the, in the story. I read in parts of it. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> Projects take a long time sometimes. Sometimes they take a long time, yeah. Now we have a special announcement that we want to share with all you kids in Grindhouse land. We're putting on our own Grindhouse celebration and Ralph's debut film. There's nothing out there. We'll be playing in 35 millimeter at 11.30 p.m. at the Lumiere Cinema, August 11th with Ralph in person. Ralph will be bringing a few caps, T-shirts, CDs of the soundtrack for sale. I'm sure he'll sign whatever you buy off him and... Uh, before Ralph's film, we'll be showing the world premiere of our documentary Masters of the Grind at 7.30, and, uh, which features Ralph's father, Victor, and Jack Hill, and Don Edmonds, and William Deere, Sybil Danning, Larry Cohen, Dean Cundy, Herschel Gordon-Lewis, Leon Isaac Kennedy, and many more. And many of the stars of uh, the film will be there in person, along with my editor, co-producer, Emmy-nominated Stevie White Chulis, and, and we'll uh, be signing Masters of the Grind posters. And um, on Saturday, we're doing a Grindhouse releasing marathon featuring the, the Beyond Pieces and Cannibal Holocaust all in 35 millimeter with a bunch of surprises. And Sunday, Vinegar Syndrome Marathon, your, your buddies, uh, yeah. with Don't Go in the Woods uh, on 35 and Night Train to Terror on 35 and, and kicking the day off with the restoration of Shriek of the Mutilated with actor producer Ed Adlam, who also did Invasion of the Blood Farmers. And uh, both marathons will start at noon and run past uh, midnight. And you can get your tickets now at LumiereCinema.com. That's L-U-M-I-E-R-E-C-I-N-E-M-A.com. And uh, we need all your support selling out these movies so we can have another festival in a couple months. And there are a number of the films we wanted to show in the future, but we didn't get to play this time around. Some of these films have never screened in L.A. and some of the films have never played at all. The goal of the Grindhouse celebration is to honor old exploitation, old school exploitation and a champion contemporary genre cinema and give them a home to play and exist. I want to thank Ralph for sitting down with us. I'm so excited to finally see there's nothing out there on the big screen. I'm glad I, I, I waited, <laughs> you know, every time I got was going to see it on Blu-ray, something happened. So I'm like, oh. so glad to see it, you know, in an audience with just a bunch of crazy freaks, the pack crowd. And oh, yeah, great. And, and my, with any luck, I mean, I'm really pushing. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to bring my father and my mother, the producer, editor, and executive producer of the film, to come to the event on the on the eight, on the eleventh. Um, I'm flying back to New York uh, in two weeks to you know hope they're up to it and get them out here for it because I think they'll have a great time seeing the documentary and the movie on the big screen. You know they're they're getting up there. You know my father's ninety two, and um, but uh, I think he'll have a really nice time. And, and he's. You know, he's, he's, he's known, you know, he's, he did like, he's a lot of documentaries, but his genre credits, um, not only blood sucking freaks and, uh, there's nothing out there, but, uh, they include Joel and Reed's bloodbath. Um, he was the post -edit supervising editor on just before dawn. Um, he was, uh, the famous, uh, Ganjin Hess, which, uh, is the big black 
vampire movie that Spike Lee remade. Um, that's one of his uh, famous movies. And um, yeah, so he's, he's got some good, uh, some good credits in, in the genre stuff, as well as, you know, my movies, Nightmare Man and a bunch of other stuff that I did over the years. And of course, I worked with him as much as I could. So um, yeah, so it'd be, it'd be great to see him. So oh, if, to see you guys both together uh, at that screening, that'll be the hottest ticket in LA right there, buddy. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out, showing us the, the monster. And I can't wait to see that guy in the big screen, just terrorizing people. <coughs> Uh, it's yep. going to be awesome. Rolf, uh, is there anything uh, you're working on now or coming up that, that you want to talk about? Well, yeah, I guess there's a few things. I mean, I, I, I jump around. I mean, in order to make a living in this business, you got to kind of do everything if you can uh, genre wise. So even though I love genre horror films, I've done lifetime thrillers and family films and romantic comedies. I've got a few romantic comedies that we're talking about that might be shot in Jamaica later this year, which would be awesome. And uh, one of the, the genre stuff, that I'm really excited about. There's a, a comic book. I, I started branching off into comic books a little bit too. And there's a comic book that you may or may not have heard of called Undead Inbreds, which is done by some guys up in Canada. It's uh, They've done 10 issues. 11th issue is just being premiered uh, at Comic-Con this week. And they one asked me if I would guest write the comic book, do all the dialogue for it. They'd drawn all the pictures of it, which was kind of cool. And um, I said, yes. But the reason they contacted me was I was hired to write the live action movie version that they want to do of as a feature, if they can raise the money for it. And, uh, it's, it's got, it's like, you know, um, there's a very text chainsaw massacre, you know, evil dead zombies, Nazis, uh, everything goes kitchen sink, how, you know, Hills run, red, Hills, Hills have eyes. Um, and Hills run red too, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, my, my thought was, you know, I wanted to really play around with the, the female characters who were getting like abused because it's, it's very, very, very un PC and not, you know, I mean, I'm like, can you even do something like this in today's environment? Well, of course, Terrifier too. And there's exceptions that are doing great, but I thought it'd be actually fun to have a group of women who are like on a retreat dealing with, you know, problems with men and eating disorders. And they're the ones to get abducted. And then it becomes this sort of battle of like the, the woke versus the, uh, the most unwoke <laughs> in the world. And I haven't quite seen that done in, in a horror comedy. It's, you know, an over the top version. So it, it, it was able to address a lot of issues and this sort of like, you know, PC-ness and stuff, even with the women themselves are talking about, you know, one says, you know, you, you know, you have a killer body and it's like, you can't say that. It's like, I'm not body shaming. I'm body complimenting. He goes, well, that's no good either. Well, what can I say then? I don't know. You know, so it's like, you know, people are so like, <laughs> I'm scared to say anything now. It's walking in eggshells. And as an artist, uh, you know, a writer, especially writing comedy now, it's 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 a it's it's very hard. It's like, how do you write something where everyone can be offended by something? So uh, this was a great way to kind of like bring that issue up in in a in a crazy crazy way. So uh, bring fingers crossed that that could be one of my returns to the genre if that happens. Sounds amazing, buddy. Cool, cool. cool. Buddy. Awesome, man. Well, uh, right. we'll we'll talk to you soon, and uh, and we'll see you down at the theater. Okay, sounds great. All, All right, right, buddy. Thanks. Take okay. it easy. You too.